Up next on U.S. Bank Business Watch, presented by the Cincinnati Business Courier, UC Health is at the center of a life-changing research that impacts many young athletes. Why did the vote turn out the way it did? And what's next for the city of Cincinnati? Some post-election analysis this morning. And a sneak peek into Cooper's Hawks Winery and Restaurant, opening tomorrow in Kenwood. U.S. Bank Business Watch is next. Good morning. Welcome to U.S. Bank Business Watch. I'm Brian Patrick. On the Business Courier front page, centerpiece this week, Saving the Game, a fascinating in-depth story about a local effort to make football a safer sport for athletes. Brain-jarring blows are as old as football, along with the macho inclination to just shake it off. But as we learn more about the brain damage caused by concussions, attitudes are changing the game. Members of the sports medicine program at the University of Cincinnati are developing techniques to train football players how to absorb or avoid the kind of contact that causes concussions. Their patients include Bearcat football players. The University of Cincinnati has been extremely successful in mitigating concussions because we have a very aggressive program and a very cohesive team working to prevent the concussions. We have a whole uh, preseason and UC football camp training regimen that we adopted several years ago and have been evolving. According to the program leaders, the research being done at UC is only being done here. The impact is likely to be felt not only at the college level, but also at high schools throughout greater Cincinnati, and not just for football players. players tend to have a problem with a second hit from a concussion where they perhaps land on their ponytail, and it's like landing on a rock. And so a few of my athletes in northern Kentucky have dubbed it the Cindy Lou Who do uh, with the hair piled up on top of their head. So it's not interfering with either heading the ball or landing on the back of their head. UC Health has forged partnerships to become the official medical provider to 26 local schools. In September, Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center revealed that emergency part department visits by high school students and other kids with sports-related brain injuries increased by more than 91% over a 10-year period. Football was the sport most commonly responsible for such injuries. There's a lot more to this story by reporter Barrett Brunsman. Be sure to read it in print or online at the Business Courier. Well, the University of Cincinnati Research Institute is partnering with GE Aviation Research Center on a first-of-its-kind effort here in Ohio. This is a rendering of the facility GE Aviation scientists and engineers are investing nearly $100 million for capital improvements at the Evendale facility and committing $6 million over the next three years to fund six researchers and 19 UC undergraduate and postgraduate students who will work in the center. The UC Research Institute is putting up $1 million over three years to buy equipment to support the research projects. GE Aviation's Vice President of Engineering says the partnership is important to further Ohio's aerospace capabilities. The new research center will initially focus on analyzing new methods of burning fuel more efficiently, cleaner, and at a lower cost. Well, Procter & Gamble subsidiary Influx, Inc. has decided to lease a vacant industrial building in Hamilton to do something that could save the company a whole lot of money. P&G will develop plastics processing technology for injection molding, a packaging breakthrough that could save at least $200 million annually. The plant is expected to open in the spring and will employ 221 workers within three years. The building is on nearly 30 acres adjacent to the Ohio State Route 4 bypass. On election day last Tuesday, John Cranley swept into the mayor's office by a 58 to 42 percent margin. Three reasons for that victory stand out. According to our reporter Chris Wetterick, voters were fed up with the escalating price of the city's streetcar, dismayed at a deal to lease the city's parking meters, and because Cranley's opponent, Roxanne Qualls, broke the number one rule in politics. Don't let your opponent define you. Now, Cranley is defining his priorities for the future, which begins when he is sworn in as mayor of Cincinnati on December 1st. I'm going to reach out to all the members of council who are elected and start working on, on, on moving this city forward on the priorities that I think they really want, which are 
you know, police and fire and reducing the violence and investing in jobs and job creation and building a more inclusive city. Three new members were also elected to city council. Kevin Flynn, Amy Murray, and David Mann returning to council. Lori Quinlevin and Pam Thomas lost their seats, as did Roxanne Qualls. She actually gave up the seat to run for mayor. To provide some analysis on what happened and why, Business Courier editor Rob Dahmeyer is joined by local political expert and Xavier University political science professor Gene Beaupre here in the studio. Gentlemen. Thank you very much, Brian. Gene, thanks for being here. Glad to uh, be here. A couple of different surprises. I thought some of the new faces on council were, at least to me, a bit of a surprise. I think the, the giant margin that Cranley won, I, I don't know that many people thought it would be that big, right. but the turnout was really not great. It, it was not only surprise, surprising, it was discouraging. I mean, it, it's the lowest turnout in the last five elections as I look back. And, you know, there were, there were not only was there a mayor's race, which you would think would be a draw, not only was a mayor's race really have issues that people could relate to, but it was the first time we were voting, I think, in the history of our charter for four-year terms for uh, council members. And, and ironically, Lori Quinlivan, who was the principal advocate for that, lost in that. And, uh, you know, you think if people didn't show up, uh, or even if they did, but in either case, it's four years now before you get to make a judgment about your council member again. And, and I think that's daunting. Yeah, so we've got a long time with this group here. Right, we do. And so what are they going to do uh, moving forward? Um, Cranley ran really on two issues. He's going to stop the streetcar and he's going to try to get rid of this parking lease deal that, uh, you know, has been fairly controversial. He, it looks like he has uh, the votes on council. He has enough allies on council. But what are they going to do uh, starting when they're sworn in next month? What do you think is going to happen? Well, I think even prior to that, uh, the mayor-elect has to organize council. He has to decide who's going to chair what committees. It's just one of the powers the mayor has, which he can use either to you know, reward his friends or punish his enemies. And uh, we'll see what he does with that. He's made some uh, noises about it, but he's been pretty quiet about it. And he does have uh, a majority on those two issues. You know, council is much less partisan. There, there isn't a block of Democrats, a, a block of Republicans, and so forth. And um, uh, it's going to, they will have to form coalitions around every kind of issue. One of the things that happens when you get elected to council is you don't just to go in, get to go in and push your issue. Right. You have to deal with every issue that comes before you. And, you know, that can be not only a, a weight on you, but, you know, you have to compromise with people and all that. So he needs to have some control over that, and he does at this point. But going forward, you know, we'll just have to see, as, as you say, it's four years. It's four years, and it's, it's really going to be a lot, uh, especially the first couple months, I think, are going to be really, could be dramatic. Well, thanks for being here. Sure. Gene. Brian. All right, thanks, Rob. Gene, it's good to have you back with us. Cincinnati accounting firm Barnes Denig is merging another local firm into its operations, giving it a new northern Kentucky presence. The merger with Berkey, Sparks, and Kremer will lift Barnes Denig to the fifth slot among greater Cincinnati's largest CPA firms when it takes effect January 1st. Berkey, Sparks, and Kramer will add a little bit to uh, a different line of a service or maybe additional services, just some governmental expertise that we have. Um, we're looking for just the advantage from Barnes Denning of just the expanded services, an expanded range of services, and, and both firms will uh, benefit from a greater depth of skill set uh, of our people. Currently, 10% of Barnes Denig's clients are in northern Kentucky, while Berkey, Sparks, and Kremer gets about 70% of its business from northern Kentucky. The mortgage business is in our top five list this week, so we asked the regional manager for the third federal savings how the business of residential mortgages is going right now. Overall, Snow Mendelson says since the recession and the housing crisis, consumers no longer view their house as a liquid asset. Banks are more cautious in lending, and credit standards have tightened. I would say certainly we're not doing the type of volume we did 10 years ago. But our, but, but our overall volume has increased in 2012 and 2013. In case you're wondering where Snow Mendelson got her unusual first name, she tells us she was born in Sarajevo, which hosted the 1984 Winter Olympics, and she was born in a snowstorm. I was wondering. A new winery and restaurant opens tomorrow in Kenwood. Cooper's Hawk Winery and Restaurant is new to Cincinnati. Menu items include upscale appetizers, entrees, and desserts that are created with handcrafted wines in mind. The restaurant is the first in this area. We founded Cooper's Hawk in 2005 in Orland Park, Illinois, a south suburban uh, city in Chicago. And we have since, this is our 13th restaurant, uh, we'll produce over 200,000 cases of wine this year. McInery said the company earned $100 million in revenue last year. 
Up next this morning on U.S. Bank Business Watch, a payday is coming for former members of Urban Active. And could it be? Is a Weber Grill restaurant actually headed for the banks? Here's some news you may have missed if you're not reading the Business Courier online every day or following us on Facebook and Twitter. A class action settlement will mean cash for former Urban Active fitness members. The lawsuit claims that Urban Active charged a bogus $15 facility improvement or maintenance fee, failed to honor cancellation notices or contracts, continued to charge members after they canceled, and misrepresented the terms and durations of contracts. The settlement could potentially result in more than $19 million in payments to about half a million former members. It is the end of an era for Blockbuster, which is closing its remaining company-owned stores in the U.S. and ending its DVD mail services January 2014. Parent company Dish Network made that announcement last week. Franchised and licensed stores will remain open. There are three remaining stores in Cincinnati, one on Kenwood Road, the other on Glen Estee Withamsville Road, and one on Colrain Avenue. Fares at the Cincinnati Northern Kentucky International Airport remained higher than all but one airport in the nation for the second quarter. CBG's average domestic fare was just over $518, according to the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. Only Huntsville, Alabama was higher. The airport has improved its fares, though. The average is down 4.8% from last year and 15.5% from 2000. Still, the cost of flying from CBG is well above the national average, which is about $377. The owners of the former Inquirer building downtown Cincinnati have selected HGC as the construction manager for the $27 million conversion of the office tower into a dual-purpose Hampton Inn and Homewood Suites Hotel. Spree Hotels purchased the building at 6th and Vine Street last year. Once completed, the historic Inquirer building will include 144 Hampton Inn units and 105 Homewood Suites units. Opening is expected in early 2015. And for all you Weber Grill fans, Weber Grill Restaurant, where all the food is cooked on authentic Weber Grills, is looking to expand into the Cincinnati market. We're told Weber Grills is looking at several Cincinnati area properties, including the banks downtown. No date set, though, for a decision to be made. Well, the price of a gallon of unleaded fuel fell to under $3 a gallon at some gas stations this week. Prices were as low as $2.86 at the new Murphy Express and some nearby Speedway stations on 42 in Florence. They've been falling quite a bit and could even continue to drop. In this morning's U.S. Bank Economic 360, Mike Deniman, Vice President and Senior Portfolio Manager at U.S. Bank, joins us to talk about what's going on. Mike, that situation in Florence is kind of an anomaly. That's a new station. There's a lot of competition there. Sure. So that's a, a, a gas war, which is a little different from the, the, the trend we've seen nationally. So uh, that, that's uncommon. But the price nationally has, has fallen pretty dramatically. We're at 324 now nationwide. Uh, that's uh, the lowest point so far this year and about 50 cents less than the, the, the high we saw back in March. Uh, perhaps more importantly, though, as you noted, that when we look at the commodities futures market, we see gasoline falling even further. So I think that's a trend that we're likely to see continue. There are always a, a number of factors that go into the price of gasoline. You know, whether there's turbulence in a part of the world, uh, the, the price of oil crude perhaps going down. What's behind this decline? Sure. So you, you hit the nail on the head. Oil is the biggest factor in the price of gasoline, and it has fallen quite a bit. It was as high as $110 a barrel just two or three months ago. Now it's down nearer to $90 a barrel. So that certainly helps. But it's also a, a, a factor of, of supply and demand. Uh, Americans aren't driving as much, demand not very high, but supply has been rising. We've had some refineries that have come back online recently. They were down for some routine maintenance. They're now adding production and the stockpiles that were set aside to perhaps prepare for a hurricane disruption, which weren't needed, now are coming into the market as well. So we have a whole lot of supply, not a lot of demand that's pushing prices down. Kind of a glut. So do you th see things continuing to decline? Yeah, I think because of what we're seeing in the futures market, that's likely to happen. And that's a good thing for the economy as a whole. You know, the less money that you 
you're using to fill up the tank, the more that you've got to spend elsewhere. Of course, um, there will be increased demand going into the holiday season. People travel for Thanksgiving and the Christmas holidays. Do you think we're going to see a spike as a result of that, or will it stay low? It, it all depends. You know, it, it will, you know, demand. Americans traditionally have used more gasoline when price is low, and then they cut back when the price is high. So it, it's kind of a, a, a vicious cycle. With prices falling, people might be more inclined to travel more. They might be inclined to, to uh, you know, purchase a second car. These sorts of things factor in, and so the falling price of gas really has a large determinant on that. But the idea that people are spending less for gas means they have more to spend elsewhere in the economy. Sure. Uh, it's not a huge savings for the average consumer. Probably it only works out to 10 or $15 a week. But to put that in perspective, if you think about the average American family will probably spend between seven and $750 this year on their holiday shopping. So if between now and year end that family saves 100 or $150 because of lower gas prices, that makes a sizable difference in their budget multiply that across all the families in the U.S., and you see that it has the potential to make a real difference in, in the, the direction of the economy. Isn't there somewhat of a psychological thing here, too, when people are paying a little less for gas, they don't feel quite so pressured financially? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, the nearer we get to that $3 mark, which is kind of a psychological hurdle, the closer we get to that, and if nationwide we go below that, that I think is going to make a real difference as well. All right, Mike, we appreciate you, and U.S. Bank, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Coming up next on U.S. Bank Business Watch, what do squirrels, boats, and thoroughbreds have in common? We'll tell you and talk about this book with the author. And congratulations to Dr. Ellen Ayer, a neurosurgeon with the Mayfield Clinic University of Cincinnati Neuroscience Institute, another of our 40 Under 40 honorees. with us this morning in our business insight squirrels boats and thoroughbreds that's rather unusual name for a new book by a local entrepreneur Jamie Gerdson it focuses on leadership and innovation for today's small traditional business now Gerdson is president of a traditional Cincinnati business you probably have heard of Apollo heating and cooling and plumbing in his book he presents a roadmap for traditional businesses to follow he says the key is separating sound thinking from conventional thinking one leads to success the other merely maintains the status quo. Jamie Gerdson is with business courier publisher Jamie Smith in the studio. Jamie and Jamie. Thanks, Brian. Jamie, thanks for being here today. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, Brian mentioned two or three times in that intro traditional business. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit. What, do you, what does he mean or what do you mean by traditional business? So when we look at the space that we're in, we look at the markets in general. There's startup space, which are businesses that literally get capital, have an idea, and start. There are Fortune 500 businesses. I think of traditional businesses in that space of sort of the 96% of the world that had, or at least in the U.S., that is a million dollars in revenue or less. Okay. But more importantly, typically 100 employees or less that are doing traditional things like heating, cooling, plumbing, um, you know, the dry necessities. cleaning, sort of the basics or the service industry in general. Okay. Well, when you talk about leadership in the book, uh, do you feel like small and medium-sized businesses get the credit for good leaders, or do you think they're often overlooked? You know, I think there is a lot of focus today on the startup sort of the really sexy startup businesses, the different kind of technologies that are coming out. There is um, a lot of uh, leadership thought around the Fortune 500, um, but it's this middle, er, you know, the middle place where we live and we actually, the traditional business creates jobs. They create sustainability in markets. 96% um, they would say are a million dollars or less, and that's 96% of all businesses in the U.S. So really, I don't think a lot of people think about thought leadership in those businesses, but I think if you look around, a lot of the thought leaders are actually are, are there. Yeah. We also talk a lot about being a visionary and, mm -hmm. and just vision in general. Right. Why is it so important to have a vision of the future and not just be caught up in t business today? Well, it might sound cliche, but if you don't have a map and you don't know the destination, how are you going to get there? Um, we talk a lot about, uh, in my organization, about a painted picture, about literally taking a piece of cardboard, you know, white paperboard, and just putting pictures of things that you kind of 
create a vision or a future and sharing that with your employees or your family or your significant other to really get an idea about what direction do I want to go, how do I visualize that, and then what happens is you subconsciously start to make decisions around that vision. Okay, great. Squirrels, boats, and thoroughbreds. Yeah. You gotta gotta give us some insight. Okay. So th not everybody's gonna appreciate this, okay? So, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go for it. So let's talk about squirrels for a minute. So every business, right, has squirrels and dogs. And a lot of people will not necessarily again like this, but dogs will never climb a tree. And unfortunately, we have people in organizations that are dogs and we have people that are squirrels. So we tend to want to try to focus on the squirrels uh, and put more energy into the squirrels because the last I checked, I tried to train a 13-year-old lab to climb a tree for a long time and he never <laughs> got up the tree. Uh, the second thing is, um, boats. So that came back from my rowing career uh, when I rowed competitively for a long time. And what I found is the fastest boats were what I call the quietest. And they were the easiest to win in because we were all focused on similar things. Um, and thoroughbreds, right? So if we, look at, if we look at organizations or sports teams, sports teams might be the easiest for this example. Um, sport teams, sports teams in general, if they have all top five, all top tier talent, are not necessarily the greatest performers. So yes, you need thoroughbreds, but at the same time, you also need sort of Indians, not yeah. all chiefs. <laughs> So make, makes perfect sense. Yep. When I read the book this summer, I was fortunate enough to, to meet you last year during uh, Leadership Cincinnati. Yep. You gave me a copy yep. of the book. One of the things that I really took away were basically the takeaways at the end of each chapter. Yeah. I mean, it was like an action plan sure. for what you just read. I, I really appreciated that. Tell me a little bit about, about that. So one of the challenges we'll always is we get great ideas, right? And if you don't ink it, it never happens, right? So you, you literally have to write down those ideas as you go. And one of the things I noticed in this um, chapter was I wanted to make sure the reader could stop and just stop at any point in the right. book and actually go execute the idea instead of just thinking about it. Well, it worked because I did it. Well, right. where can we find out more about the book? Where can uh, our viewers find it? You can go to jamiegertson.com. Um, or there's, you can go to fishermansfoundation.org. Okay, great. Thanks. Well, I enjoyed reading it. I'm sure our readers, our viewers will as well. And I look forward to seeing more out of you. Great. Thanks so much, Jamie. Thanks, Thanks for, for being, being here. here today. Yep. Cheers. Thanks. Brian. All right, Jamie and Jamie, thank you. One thought about squirrels. Have you ever tried to train a squirrel to get the paper for you? <laughs> Think about that. Thanks for joining us this morning for U.S. Bank Business Watch. We'll be back next Sunday and every Sunday morning, 6.30, right here on Local 12. If you want to sleep in, we're at 10 a.m. on the CW. For more business news all during the week, visit the Business Courier online to sign up for our daily emails and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. The address is CincinnatiBusinessCourier.com. For all of us at U.S. Bank Business Watch, I'm Brian Patrick. Catch the Bengals-Ravens game at 1 right here on Local 12. Have a great Sunday and a good week.